Diabolical Tales. Starring Jack Ferguson in another exciting story of dangerous intrigue, fantastic adventure, and sinister circumstance. Diabolical Tales. Many of the incidents in the story you are about to hear are based on the actual experiences and authentic records of NSA Operative 132, who for many years has investigated the men from within the Earth. our star, Jack Ferguson, as Operative 132. My name is not important, but you can call me Operative 132, or just O-132. I work on an above top secret project called Agartha, and this is my story. In a moment, listen for Jack Ferguson as Operative 132, Government Man. But first, a word from our sponsor. What happened? Ah, judging from the bump on the back of my head, I'd say we were knocked out cold, Agent Cooper. Where are we? You are in the realm of Camelot, strange foreigners. And I am Sir Kay, Knight of King Arthur. What? Is this a dream? I challenge you to a joust. Ah, I'm going to need some coffee first, Sir Kay. I have coffee mail from Hidden Hive Meadery. Wench, bring it forth. Wow, that's not the Joe I was expecting. Tis mead with coffee. Whoa, it's really good and really strong. Yes, this libation is strong. Strong like my battle armor. It's a sipping drink. Mmm. Agent Cooper, I think it's your civic duty to bring this stuff back to the 20th century. You said it, 0132. Try the new Civic Duty Coffee Mill by Hidden Hive Meadery. It's your very own Civic Duty to find it. And now, Diabolical Tales. This above-top-secret report from Project Agartha is marked The Robertson Panel. The date was Thursday, January 15, 1953. Five days out from Eisenhower's inauguration as president, General Burton, who oversaw Project Agartha, had invited me to visit the NSA's Signals Intercept Station at Fort Meade, Maryland. Apparently, they'd picked up another subterranean signal similar to the ones we'd intercepted in the past. Signals that had been sent from the legendary underground land called Agartha to its nefarious agents working on the surface to undermine humanity. Investigating and sometimes defending against the threat posed by this secret civilization was the primary focus of my work in Project Agartha. Whoa, this place is so high-tech. FBI agent Cooper had been my partner for a little under two months. He dropped onto my radar when he encountered a mysterious man from within the Earth named Zong, who murdered his previous partner. Together, we hunted Zong down and killed him before he had a chance to start an atomic war between the United States of America and the Communist Russians. Ever since then, I'd taken him on as sort of a protege, and he's been taking well to his new assignment. All this is for signals interception? How far around the world can they hear O-132? What we're listening for isn't around the world, Agent Cooper. It's down within it. Operative 132? General Burton said you'd be coming by. Uh Uh-huh. You got a recording for us? Yes, sir. Uh, does he have clearance? I'm SC3. Agent Cooper is working under me, so he's got special clearance for incidents related to our project. You can take it up with General Burton if you have any further questions regarding Agent Cooper's security clearance. Yes, sir. Uh, here we go. Proceed, Sergeant. The two surfaces. 
surface dwellers responsible for the failure of Plan Zero are known as Operative 132 and Agent Cooper, Master Sun. They work on a project that is specific to the Underworld. I am not in a position to affect their investigation. But you can conspire against them. I have already sent another agent to the surface. He will assist you. There is a top secret meeting being held regarding the surge of flying saucer activity. Operative 132 has been involved with this before. That will be the best time to strike. That was communications between them? It's the audio from a kind of stereoscopic transmission. We can't break down the visual component. We picked it up a few hours ago. They mentioned us by name. So this Zajim is either a plant or a double agent. What flying saucer meeting is being held, O-132? There's a top secret conference being held over the next few days that involves UFOs. Dr. Howard Robertson is chairing it, but it's SC-6 and above, so I wouldn't be able to get you in, Agent Cooper. And Master Zun? We've heard him before. He seems to be the, uh, uh, head honcho down there. Why do these guys all have Z names? We don't know. It's terrifying. But we've got the best chance to try to find this Zajim character at the conference. And if that's where they want to hit us, then that's where we'll find him. Let's go! General Burton managed to get me an observer pass for the Robertson panel meeting being held in the nondescript Defense Department building in Washington. As we approached the conference room, Agent Cooper and I noticed someone that we recognized. Good morning, Operative 132. Assistant Director Smith. FBI Assistant Director Smith. He was Agent Cooper's former boss. He still has a bit of a grudge against me for taking Agent Cooper off his detail. Hello, Assistant Director. Didn't realize that, uh, J. Edgar had an interest in outer space. Only in the airspace above the United States of America, Operative 132. Agent Cooper doesn't have the security clearance for this. I know. I'm here to assist Agent and... Agent Cooper is here to provide security for me, Assistant Director. Security? For what? I'm afraid that's classified. The glare that Assistant Director Smith fired at me seemed to cut a little deeper than mere interdepartmental rivalry. But then his eye line fixed on something over my shoulder, and then he broke into a somewhat unsettling smile. I hope you enjoy the conference. Operative 132. Yeah, he seemed to say my name a little louder than necessary. I shot a look over at Agent Cooper, who nodded back to me and started to look around. Thanks, Assistant Director. Please give Director Hoover my regards. <laughs> From you? He'll love to hear that. Smith turned and walked into the conference room. I pulled Agent Cooper aside. Assistant Director Smith sure did act suspiciously, didn't he? He did. That's why I need you to watch for anything going on out here. For anybody dressed in black? Are you sure? Pretty sure. They've never really figured out how obvious wearing all black is. I'd guess he'd look like Zong did, wearing a cape and all that. Affirmative 0132. It's my civic duty. Civic duty? Uh, not really, Agent Cooper. Your civic duty would be something like voting, jury duty, volunteering at a soup kitchen, or something along those lines. Well, what would you say then? I'd say it's a measure of national defense. All right. That's what it'll be then. Good man. I opened the door and walked into the conference room. There was a round table in the middle of the room with 15 or 20 scientists circling it. Everybody was watching a film of seagulls flying through the air, turning to and fro in formations. I took a seat in the back along with the other observers. After a few minutes of watching these film loops of birds, the lights came up. As you can see, these seagulls are flying in patterns that matches the style of the so-called flying saucers seen in the new house film from Utah. Therefore, I am concluding that the new house film is yet another hoax. Dr. Menzel, you're suggesting that there are great numbers of seagulls in Utah? The new house film was shot by a U.S. Navy photographer. And what would a Navy photographer be doing in a landlocked state like Utah, Dr. Heineck? 
I don't know. He said he was... While on these two argued it out, I took a quick survey of the room. All the panel members were mostly prominent scientists. But there was an interesting mix among the observers. Among the familiar faces of many military and intelligence types, I also picked FBI Assistant Director Smith out of the crowd, who was pretending not to be watching me. I've been one of the first to offer... Gentlemen, I suggest we break for lunch and come back to this case with a fresh perspective. I stood up and made for the exit. As I approached the doors, I felt a finger tapping on my shoulder. Uh, Special Agent X-132. Oh, hello there, Dr. Robinson. Standing behind me was the aforementioned Dr. Robinson. Not to be confused with Dr. Howard Robertson, who was the chair of this meeting. Now, this Dr. Robinson was a well-known, but yet still mysterious, government hack doctor who seemed to have his fingers in a little bit of everything. Our paths had crossed many times in the past. I heard you were out of this line of business. Uh, sometimes I need a little refresher course, Dr. Robinson. <laughs> sure, sure. I heard General Burton put you on that Agartha Project X-132. That's correct, Doctor. And my current designation would be Operative 132, not X-132. Oh, I didn't realize they'd move you up to NSA. That uh, makes sense. Listen, I understand you had an incident with these beans, but please know that all the research indicates that this is a race that has been regressing for thousands of years. They're barely ahead of us technologically. You seem to have a lot of knowledge on the subject, Dr. Robinson. I understand your point of view, but I wouldn't underestimate them. Do you know that the weapon you recovered from your November incident, the Electro... Electro Incinerator. It's over 2,300 years old. So you're suggesting that we ignore them because they have old technology? I'm just indicating that I think they're likely not the threat you're making them out to be. My experiences and a trail of body bags have taught me otherwise, Doctor. Excuse me. Well, until next time, Operative 132. Dr. Robinson walked out the door into the sunlight first, followed by me. Damn. So once again, Dr. Robinson was going to be a pain in my neck. I'm going to have to switch up my schedule to avoid seeing him again if possible. I saw Agent Cooper standing at the bottom of the steps. Everything good, boss? Yeah, not what I hoped for. Anything weird out here? No weirder than what we've seen before. Only a few people dressed all in black. But they weren't wearing sunglasses, so I'd guess they're not, a, uh, our targets. That's probably a good guess, Agent Cooper. We made our way around the corner and into the alley next to the Defense Department building. Okay, listen. I think if this man from within the Earth was going to strike, he'd have already done it by now. I turned and looked down the alley. I took two steps forward, passing a heap of trash cans when... A giant hulk of a man wearing a black fedora and dark tinted glasses stepped out in front of me and raised an electro incinerator right at my head. We'll be back with Operative 132 in Diabolical Tales after a word from our sponsor. It got a light. Thanks. The eagle has landed. Roulette cigarettes. Favored by secret government agents, red subversives, and average Joes alike, Roulette cigarettes are grade A American. Produced in Chestertown, Virginia, USA. Our special blend of high quality tobacco promises at best a 50-50 chance of causing improper vocal cord vibrations, increased acid reflux, and decreased lung function. Roulette cigarettes. Your next drag could be your last. But probably not. And now try Roulette Unfiltered from the Thomas Prince Company. And now we're back with Jack Ferguson as Operative 132 in Diabolical Tales, Project Agartha. There I was, about to be murdered by a giant man dressed all in black right in the alley next to a defense department building. The man thumbed a button on his electro incinerator and nothing powered up. I was a half second away from meeting my maker when Agent Cooper suddenly tackled the man in black from behind. 
but then the giant man in black somehow caught his balance and flipped Agent Cooper up over his shoulders. I drew my standard issue M1911 sidearm as Agent Cooper crashed down against the wall of the alley. The giant man in black then turned towards me, straightened his hat, and darted off down the alley in the opposite direction. Freeze, man in black! But I know I didn't have a shot. There were half a dozen people down the alley, so I ran over to help Agent Cooper up. You okay? Uh, yeah, he's big. Sure is. Are you good to run? Yeah, let's go. We burst out into the city streets in pursuit of our would-be assassin. It only took a moment before... There! He pointed in the direction of Union Station. The man in black was running into the terminal. We raced after him. He's over there! This time, Agent Cooper pointed toward a northbound train leaving on track 22. The large man in black had pushed his way through a crowd and climbed onto the rear passenger car. Go! We gotta stop him! Agent Cooper and I pushed our way through the crowd with our sidearms drawn, doing everything we could to reach that train. FBI! Stand aside! FBI! The crowd cleared for us as we ran towards the moving train. Agent Cooper ran ahead of me, took a leap, and grabbed onto the ladder at the back of the last car. I gave it everything I had. And with less than 10 feet to go before the train cleared the terminal, I took a leap and grabbed at the ladder on the back. Agent Cooper helps me onto the plank and we caught our breath for a few seconds. You okay, 0132? For now, thanks. I'll take the passenger cars. You go up top and try to cut them off. Okay. I pulled my M1911 sidearm onto my palm and hid it in my sleeve as I started walking through the rear passenger car. Scanning the crowd, I couldn't pick him out. But then, I saw him. Black fedora, black coat, round tinted glasses, moving between the cars ahead of me. And as the door closed behind him, he looked back and through the window, he paused when he saw me. And then he vanished to the right. I raced to the door and pushed it open. I dropped my sidearm back into my palm and cleared the plank between the cars. I looked just in time to see the man in black climb onto the roof. I clambered up the ladder behind him, hoping Agent Cooper had already passed us and cut him off. Freeze, man in black! I climbed to the top to see Agent Cooper ahead of us. With the man in black in between, I raised my gun as the man in black turned back towards me. He stopped when he realized he was trapped. We've got you! You're under arrest! You weak, pitiful surface dwellers! He raised his weapon, his electro incinerator, and left it kind of wavering in between Agent Cooper and I. Drop your weapon and identify yourself. He didn't move, just stared at me. And then he powered up his weapon. Drop your weapon now! Are you Zajim? He stopped sneering at me and seemed puzzled by this. I am Zen! Zen the Beard! And I am here to destroy you, Operative 132! Too many whistles to be a coincidence. I glanced ahead of us to see another train approaching at high speed on the southbound track back towards Washington, D.C. It was about to pass us by. Might be getting a bit bumpy. Last warning, man in black! <laughs> Sans jumped backwards and fired a shot off his weapon in my direction. I easily dodged the shot as he landed right on top of the passing train. Without speaking, Agent Cooper and I looked at each other and knew what we had to do. We only had seconds before the two trains passed completely, so we jumped. Somehow we made it. And now we were headed southbound, back towards Union Station. Up ahead of us, I could see the man in black running along the tops of the passenger cars toward the engine. Agent Cooper and I both raised our guns and... Our shots must have missed. Xanth appeared to reach the engine and then jumped down out of our sight. We broke into a run to reach him. We reached the edge of the first passenger car, jumped down onto the plank, and then climbed into the open door into the engine room to see the man in black alone. He had his weapon pointed at the controls. <laughs> A 
And then I looked out the front window to see Union Station dead ahead. The train was still going at top speed directly back into the terminal, and it would not stop. Agent Cooper, get down now! O-132? Are you all right? Yeah, I'm okay. We're alive? Yeah, somehow. We're in Union Station. Under it, I think. And sure enough, Agent Cooper was right. Our train, the Federal Express, had crashed through the buffer stops on Track 16 and then destroyed the Station Master's office and a newsstand. The weight of the engine was enough to collapse the concourse floor and we landed on the lower level. Despite all this, we were alive. And, uh, the man in black? Sorry, 0132. He got away. Somehow. Well, we'll get him next time, Agent Cooper. That's right. It's a measure of national defense. Yeah. Let's get a cup of joe. Fortunately, the train engineer was the only fatality. 57 were injured, but not seriously. After a few more days of deliberation, the Robertson panel would conclude that the rash of UFO reports from the public was overloading the government's ability to handle them. So they recommended conducting a secret campaign to debunk and delegitimize the topic of UFOs altogether. It was to become a taboo subject. After this new encounter with the men from within the Earth, Agent Cooper finally got his SC-4 security clearance which meant he could stay on Project Agartha as my partner. We resolved to find this enemy plant named Zajim by looking a little further into the activities of those who would have been in the know about the Robertson panel meetings. And as for Xanth the Feared, well, we wouldn't see him again until after there was a new president in office. This is Jack Ferguson. Some of the stories we bring you are so strange and fantastic that it's hard to believe that it really happened. For obvious reasons, some of the names, dates, and localities have been changed. But our stories are based on the real-life experiences of Operative 132, G-Man. And they did happen here. We hope you'll join us again next time for another adventure. Until then, remember folks, the men from within the Earth are among us. This episode of the Diabolical Tales Radio Hour starred Jack Ferguson, Brian Bedell, Kyle Stroud, Dan Jeremy Brooks, Troy Sterling Neese, Steve DeMonico, Christian Wheeler, Don Garrett, Brandon Kane, and Stuart Moyer as Santa Fear. The original score was by Troy Sterling Neese. The mix was by Dan Jeremy Brooks of Apocalypse Cow Studios. It was written by Brandon Kane and produced by Christian Wheeler, Troy Sterling Neese, Don Garrett, and Dan Jeremy Brooks. The Diabolical Tales Radio Hour is presented by Cosmic Control Productions. I'm Jack Ferguson, and I play Operative 132 on Diabolical Tales Radio Hour. While our show is a lot of fun to create, each episode costs a lot of time and money to produce. So if you like what you heard, please subscribe to the Diabolical Tales Radio Hour on your preferred medium in order to catch new episodes as they're released. And if you have the means, please consider donating to our show at patreon.com slash diabolicaltales. Patrons will help us continue to produce the show and will also give you access to bonus materials and additional content. You can also find us at diabolicaltales.com. And thank you for listening to the Diabolical Tales Radio Hour. 